my friends. Welcome to today's Rolling Rambles. Today I want to talk about secure messengers. They don't exist. Oh, sure. You might be invested in one. You might think, oh, Signal's great, or oh, Telegram is awesome, or oh, Matrix, or, or oh, uh, that other one that I can't remember the name of. Oh, God, what was that? Why can't I remember that one? There are so many of them. That's part of the problem. There are so many of these secure messenger apps, and even Facebook tried to get in on it and be like, oh, oh, now your chats are in to end encrypted with a super special password that we totally can't see. And yeah, I don't believe it for a second. The fundamental problem with any supposedly secure, supposedly private messenger application or platform is that they can't actually prove to you that they're actually secure. Because think about what actually goes into this stuff. You have a program on your device that you probably didn't look at the source code for. So already we're off to a bad start. Now granted, some of these things are open source. If you use Telegram, for example, Telegram's clients are open source, uh, at least as far as I can tell. But how do you know that what you actually receive as a package is the same thing as what is in the source repository? And already the trust breaks down. You have no way of knowing that that's the case. You have no way of being sure that what you installed on your phone or your tablet or your computer or the microchip inside your pinky is actually what they claim in the source code repository it is. So you would have to compile from source and you would have to have audited that source yourself. So we already have a very, very high barrier to entry. Now, if the source is open, at least other people can audit it for you independently and say that, oh yeah, this seems okay. So you can choose where to put your trust, but remember, the word trust really just means something that can break my security or something that can cause me significant harm if, um, if it goes wrong. This, of course, ultimately means that by trusting, you are being weak, vulnerable, you are leaving an opening, there is a flaw in your security. But there will never be such thing as perfect security. It's simply not possible. So your trust has to start somewhere. But where does it start? You don't know the people who made this software. And even if you do, you don't know if they've been compromised. How would you verify that they have or have not been compromised? A warrant canary? What if that's just, just a thing for show? There are several ways that people can supposedly prove to you over the internet that they're not compromised, and yet all of those ways fall apart if they're actually compromised. So what do you do? Where does the trust start? Well, an independent audit of the source code isn't a bad thing, um, but you know it, 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 could, it could be better. But all you've done is shift the trust. Now the question is not, do you trust the people who made Telegram? Now the question is, do you trust the independent auditor? And that's really a decision you have to make because ultimately the only safe decision is to not use any of these supposedly secure messaging applications. Uh, when you get right down to it, that is the only way to be sure. Now, of course, if you build from your own source, you know at least what your software is doing. But then we get to another layer of distrust. So let's leave your application, Let, let's just assume that your, whatever your device is, that you've built from source, or at a minimum you have um, re, re, you've built from source and verified that the, so, that the object code, that the final application that they deployed looks exactly like the one that you built. So they are running what you are running, or what you have verified. So you've audited the source code, you built the source code yourself, and you verified that what their build is the same as your build. That, that's already a high bar to clear. Let's ignore that. Let's assume you trust one of the independent auditors. Whatever. Now, on that assumption, where does all the data go? Where is all the data stored? If the data is stored on a server, you're potentially screwed. 
a server inherently has to store the data somewhere um, in a central location. Therefore, you have centralized the information. Hey, if you're wondering why there was a break there, <laughs> there's a very good reason for it. Stick around after the credit card for the outtakes and you'll find out why. Anyway, assuming that the software is okay or that you at least decide that you trust some other guy on the internet, what happens when it's gone? It goes up to the server. Well, what about the server? It's centralized. And if the server's centralized, that means somebody can come in and say, hey, we are a three-letter agency and we have a warrant or we have the ability to bully your CEO and threaten them with jail or whatever. Won't you let us in? Won't you tap your servers? I do not remember the name of the service, but there was an email service that was supposed to be a secure private email service and the FBI came knocking and demanded that they backdoor the service for a specific account and reveal that service's secret encryption keys or that account's encryption keys so that the data could be decrypted so the FBI could get their hands on it and so on and so forth. That service opted to publicly disclose what they went through and shut down all operations so as not to reveal any of the secrets, which is the highest form of integrity, literally set your whole business on fire, just so that it can live up to what it claimed. Principles, very important. But the point is, when that happens, what kind of notice do you get? If you have some sort of service that stores data for you, this doesn't just apply to messengers, it applies to email, it applies to social media, it applies to online storage like OneDrive or whatever. If you have any storage solution, and anything that stores data for you online, or about you even, you have no control over that data. And if that data is breached, you have no way of knowing unless the service by some chance is generous enough and unencumbered by an FBI or gag order, national security letter, whatever, enough to let you know that, oh, hey, by the way, we coughed up all your information and gave it to someone else. You have no way of knowing. If you've got a server and you think that you have end-to-end -end encryption, but the encrypted data stored on the server, all it takes is that key. The encryption key is literally the keys to the kingdom. It is everything in terms of storing your data and not having it revealed to people that you don't want it exposed to. So what happens with that key? Well, you assume, oh, it's end-to-end -end encrypted. Well, how does the other person get access to your key? So one of the things that I've looked at recently um, is the idea of having some centralization and you kick the infra all of these actually, Telegram and all of them, if you do end-to-end -end encryption, well, the data still goes through the servers. So how does the other person, how do you and the other person exchange encryption keys? You'd have to do it using, uh, you'd either have to exchange symmetric keys, which means the keys go in the clear. You'd have to have a pre-shared key, which how do you have a pre-shared key um, with someone that you don't know? Or you have to use a trusted root certificate for asymmetric encryption like the web does, where <clears throat> every single web server has a HTTPS certificate, a SSL certificate. That certificate is specific to that server issued by a trusted authority. So it's signed by a trusted authority. They provide a public key to you. You encrypt it using the public key and then they decrypt it with their private key. And usually what'll happen is you encrypt like your public key or whatever, you, your key with their key, whatever. So you can send a message to them now, you send them a public key, and they can use your public key to encrypt what they send you. That's called a Diffie-Hellman key exchange in, in simple terms. Um, you have their public key already, like they can send you their public key, you encrypt it, and then you, it's, it's public key encryption, really. Um, but in general, there would have to be some sort of public-private key pair and the problem is, how did that key pair get generated? It probably got generated, um, assuming this thing is as secure as possible, it got generated either on the server and then passed to your app or in your app directly. Now, your app 
generates the key on the device, right? Let's just assume that because that's the safest way to do it. How do you know that the app didn't send the key up to the service provider? Hopefully your source code audit would have figured that out. But even if it doesn't, consider Android. And this is where things get even worse. <clears throat> so we're, we're making assumptions here. We're assuming the server's not nefarious, like the, the, the software's not nefarious, but Android, iOS. iOS is a very closed system controlled by Apple. You don't actually know what iOS is doing. But Android is an open system, except for all the parts that aren't open. To have a modern Android phone um, and to run, say, a basic banking app, you have to have stock Android unrooted running Google frameworks uh, that have all these integrity APIs that verify that your Android is unrooted and hasn't been modified. So you have all this Google stuff forcing you into a Google ecosystem. Now that's not the point, but the point is Android is almost always accompanied by Google services frameworks. So Google services frameworks, let, let, let me relate something to you, for example. Let's say you set up ad blocking. You set up Next DNS as your private DNS server in Android, and you put your phone in airplane mode, and then you terminate all running instances of all applications, and you run whatever. I have one called Frequency Generator. It, it, it loves to kick up ads every four screens or so. <clears throat> if I go into airplane mode, have been using Next DNS or AdGuard DNS um, for months even, despite all that, despite not having a connection to the internet and using an ad blocking DNS server, I will still see Google ads. In Frequency Generator, I see Google ads with no connection to the internet with which to download those ads. It is because what is happening in the background is the Google frameworks on your phone are prefetching ads to show to you, even if you're offline, without your permission to do so. They are using your data in the background without your permission to acquire advertising garbage to provide to apps if they're offline. So, if this stuff is going on in the background, what else could be going on in the background? Well, if, if you're running something, some sort of secure messaging app, perhaps Google Services Framework has this, this overreaching blessing from the Android ecosystem where they can see your private keys in flight, where they can spy on your content, where they can see, oh, you're running, uh, you know, a Matrix or Session or the other one with an X in it um, that I can't remember the name of for some reason. And it can go into the memory and be like, hey, um, here's how you find the private keys in the application's memory on the phone. Uh, go get them and send them up to us. You have no way of knowing that that is not happening. Now, granted, if we were going to work on um, the whole like innocent until proven guilty standard, the legal standard for like criminal acts, we would say, okay, Google's not doing anything malicious unless we uh, unless we have evidence, convincing, clear, strong evidence otherwise. But we're not talking about a the legal standard for like finding people guilty of a crime or finding people. Um, to be responsible in a lawsuit, a civil lawsuit, we're talking about security. And in security, if something can do something, you have to assume that it is doing that something because it could be doing that something. So you, you have this perfect mixture with that. Even if your application is bulletproof, even if the servers don't let the FBI t uh, get in there and screw with your stuff, no matter what you do, even if even if the whole chain is fine, Google could still be going in there and snatching your encryption keys and delivering them to the FBI on the back end. There are so many possibilities in that regard. You don't have any way of auditing your closed source proprietary Android phone software. 
you can look at the Android Open Source Project, which does not have the source for the Google Services frameworks, or a whole lot of the other basic applications that most phones have now. And with iOS, it's like that on steroids. With iOS, you have the same situation as Google, but there's even less source you can audit. You can't even look at the open source parts because the only stuff on Apple operating systems that's open is the Darwin kernel. I'm not 100% sure they even use that on the phones, but I think they do. But anyway, auditing the kernel won't tell you anything about a lot of this stuff that can actually breach your privacy. Low-level services are not the same thing as these higher-level frameworks that have God status on your device that can be used as an exploit, essentially a workaround for all your privacy settings to go and fetch and deliver ads to you anyway, despite every effort that you put in to not get them. Well, if they can do that for ads, they can do that for all kinds of other stuff. Consider also that those Google uh, services frameworks are also automatically updating outside of the Google Play Store itself. The, the Google Play services update without your permission, without your knowledge, whenever, automatically, which means code can be put on your device by someone else at any time for any reason that could do anything. So even if you were able to audit everything on your device, even then you still don't know for sure that Google has not sent out a silent update to their services frameworks that ha now they can spy on you. You have no way of knowing. And I know, I know, if you're paranoid and you don't want to feel scared, you know, maybe maybe you've been crypto scamming people, or maybe you've been looking at pictures of people that are a an age lower than 20 on the internet, you know, if you're scared, your first response to this kind of thing is going to be, hey, wait a minute, now that's just bullshit. All of that doesn't sound real because blah, 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 blah. Because <clears throat> why would Google do that? That doesn't make sense, blah, blah, blah. But we're not talking about, you know, your insecurities. We're talking about actual security. And so it doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter what you say in response as an emotional sort of protection for your ideology to prevent yourself from being afraid that they'll catch you crypto scamming uh, or looking at people uh, in middle school on the internet. Uh, or stalking Instagram people, or whatever uh, questionable activity you engage in. Uh, we don't care about that. Right now, what we're talking about is security. And security requires that you think all of these things through. At some point, no matter how you look at it, trust began somewhere. And the real problem, in the end, is trust. Where? Where do you begin trusting? What do you blindly assume is not malicious? What do you just assume is okay without any kind of verification? Just, okay, we'll just accept that this is the way it is, and that's it. If I had to pick a point to begin trusting, I would probably pick some kind of independent auditor that was well-known for what they do. Although there's no reason that an independent auditor could not be convinced by a government uh, agency to write a false article of some sort. Um, so even then, the trust is not absolute. But if you could get uh, an independent auditor of some sort that is reputable, at least, maybe, you could make the assumption that the software is okay, and then you could look at the server-side thing. If there is a server, you can pretty much assume that it's unsafe. I know there are some things that are like, oh yeah, we have servers, but it's end-to-end -end encrypted, so we can't see anything. But how do you know? How, how do you know? You only know if the software running on your thing is the exact same. There's just so many variables. But at some point, you have to make an assumption that, hey, okay, we have to assume this is clean to start with, and then we'll go from there. Uh, personally, um, I don't even know that what I just said is good enough. I think that at some point, you really just have to go back and say, maybe it's safer to write it on an index card and hand it to the person. And that's sort of where I land now. 
for years I've actually thought about how a decentralized um, private system for exchanging information would function in the real world. And ultimately you do have to trust somewhere. I think the best solution is we need a system that is new, that has source code that you can audit and understand on your own without uh, having some sort of expert go mess with it for you, um, but that experts could audit. Um, and then that source code, there should be proof that that source code compiles to the application that you're wondering about. And then the system should be fully decentralized. That means servers are a no-go. Any centralization is automatically a weak point because you can have correlation attacks where they don't even know that it's you necessarily, but they can look at what's going on with the communication to this central point and they can, for example, send traffic and that traffic will get kicked back um, through the system and they can see, oh, if we send a bunch of crap here with this signature or whatever, it comes out there. There's no foolproof way around that. In fact, if someone controls enough of any given solutions, nodes or, um, you know, entry exit points or internet service provider attachments or whatever, if someone can monitor enough of those, they will always be able to correlate things to the point that they can make guesses with astonishing accuracy. Um, and at that point, it doesn't take much to unmask you and which ID is you and what you're doing and so on and so forth. So a decentralized system, a, an identity-less unless you wish to have an identity system, um, auditable source code, verifiable object code, and the information should not be, um, the source of information must be ambiguous. The way that I always envisioned a decentralized system working is sort of like Tor, but not quite. With Tor, you wrap packets in um, metadata that um, every, every single hop point, you basically plan out the route it'll go, wrap it in metadata for each point, and then at each point it unwraps a layer of metadata, thus the onion router, thus Tor, has layers like an onion. Um, I would not do this. I would break information down into chunks. Um, those chunks would get signatures that represent them, and then those signatures would be distributed by sending it out to the other nodes that you know. And the problem is, um, if you wanted to know the source node for a piece of information, all the stuff being sent around will be stateless, so you wouldn't know who sent it. All you would know is this neighbor node that I am talking directly to sent me this information. I have no way of knowing for sure if said neighbor node uh, got that information from another node on my behalf and relayed it, or if they have it in their own local data store um, and sent it directly. Uh, another thing that I would do that I think would be pretty unique, and I don't think even IPFS does this, um, and I, IPFS is close to what I would want, but anytime I see the word blockchain, I immediately dismiss any sort of decentralized solution because blockchains have serious issues, uh, mainly with scalability. Once the chain gets long enough, the cost of verification is so bad that it's pointless. But um, anyway, ignoring the blockchain aspect, um, one of the things that I thought would be great would be having plausible deniability baked into the system. And a lot of these secure messengers don't have that. Sure, they have end-to-end -end encryption, but your phone's probably protected by a fingerprint. Oops, well, uh, <laughs> fingerprints are not constitutionally protected the way passwords are. So, you know, biometrics in general aren't. So, boom, that okay, they can get in now. So that's not safe at all. Um, but ignoring that, uh, it doesn't really matter. Like, if you have a system and you, let's say, let's, let's use the torrent model. You download a file and store it locally. Okay, you're responsible for that file. I hate to take it here, but I have to take it here for the purposes of this argument. Let's assume that you downloaded mm, not legal adult material. Um, through the service, because that is generally considered the ultimate taboo 
the ultimate thing that no one will ever defend. Um, but it's perfect for examining security. I don't know if you've noticed, but um, it's sort of like a canary in the coal mine for security. So, any system that you could call this Jody's, uh, Jody's annoying but true decentralized um, private information sharing system doctrine, if you want, any system that works effectively for fully decentralized, un, um, uncensorable distribution would inevitably have to be able to distribute illegal adult material without anyone really being able to stop it. And unfortunately, that is the truth. Now, do you want to be responsible for this? No, of course not. Especially, let's say you did not download it, but you have a data store and the data store automatically gets packets containing encrypted versions of pieces of it and stores it in the data store. Well, if plausible deniability is baked into the system, then the encryption key for that data is not part of the data. The data chunk's encrypted with a key that you get from, say, a, a directory somewhere, or it's part of the file listing when you run a search on metadata. So the key's not kept with the data. So if you have data chunks, they're anonymous data chunks, which means if you are a completely innocent bystander, someone uploads the scummiest um, adult material known to man, and you end up with a piece of it in your data store, well, you can plead ignorance because the system is rigged to where, even if that's the case, you actually have no way of seeing that that's what it is because it's encrypted against you, the user. You can't just have the data. You have to have the key, and to have the key, you have to find it through some other means. So because the system would be encrypted against you finding out what you actually have in your store, the data itself, no matter how reprehensible, you're protected because you don't know what it is. And whoever it is that sent it to you is protected because it's going out everywhere and being distributed, but they have no way um, of controlling it once it's out there. So once it's gone, it's gone. And it floats around encrypted, and the only way to find out what it is is to be looking for it and have the key for it. Oh, hey there. You might have noticed that this video is disjointed because now I'm at a wider angle. I'm being followed by airplane beacons, apparently, and I forgot where it was that I was in the discussion. But anyway, back to the messenger issue. Uh, the bottom line, and really, I just need to seal it up. There is no such thing as a secure messenger. End-to-end -end encryption is a myth unless you can verify it from one end to another. And it doesn't really matter all that much what the technical means are. Um, one way or the other, uh, unless you can find a way using public key cryptography and you can be sure that the traffic's not being uh, intercepted somewhere in the middle, um, <laughs> but even then, yeah, it's still an issue. There's not much you can do to guarantee that your secure messenger is actually secure, end-to-end uh, -end encrypted or whatever, unless you somehow can share keys with the other party without going through any kind of middleman. That doesn't just mean servers. That means uh, going through internet routers as well. Because one of the things that I, I remember leaving out before I did the cut is that when you do the Diffie-Hellman key exchange for HTTPS, and by the way, I, I, don't, I don't deal in this a lot, like programmatically, so I may be a little rusty on all the exact details, but the gist of it is you send a public key, they send a public key, and then you um, exchange a symmetric key instead of an asymmetric key using the asymmetric public-private key pairs. Um, the problem is if I send a public key to a peer and then that peer um, sends back their public key and that's how we set up communication, well, a man in the middle can intercept my public key send send a public key of their own, and then basically just act as a middleman between to where they get to see all the decrypted communications. That's kind of the problem. And that's actually why certificate authorities exist. So that the people who have an SSL certificate on the server, they can actually um, prove this that I am who I say I am, and here's a key that is signed by this common authority um, so you can 
verify the communication is from me and not from a man in the middle that's attempting to intercept us. It's actually a critical component. You can't do that without a certificate authority because that's a, a certificate authority is centralization. And centralization, as we have gone over, is something that can be poisoned, that can be tapped, that one way or the other, it is a big weakness in any sort of truly decentralized, um, privacy-focused communications network. So this problem is not, it, it is inherently um, unsolvable without offline communications. And th there really is no good solution for it. But the, the system that I was coming up with, my solution was to always assume that you're being man in the middle, to always assume that whoever you're talking to, you don't know who it is. You don't know if they're good or bad. You don't know if they're malicious. All that you know is that they talk to you. And all that anybody knows is that you, know, you, you and others talk to them. So the network works by just talking to whoever's near you regardless of who it is and it relies very heavily on that entity not being able to tell whether or not you are the person that originated the request versus somebody else. So in this way, if you're talking to three nodes and one of them is the FBI <clears throat> and the other two are just normies using your network, I use normies as in like decent, you know, typical um, non-malicious users people who aren't trying to lock you up for sharing state secrets using your super secret network. So if one of them is the FBI and you talk to the FBI, unless the FBI can also intercept all of your communications and perform correlation attacks, where they can see that traffic goes in and out of your entire connection, you know, X, Y, or Z way, unless they can correlate your traffic, they don't know if you're a repeater or an initiator, because it looks the same. <clears throat> now, correlation attacks are a problem too, so what was my solution to that? Don't allow correlation by reaching out to other people, setting up connections with them, and then you communicate with them in the same way. You'll send junk data or send other data roughly around the same time. So if someone asks for something, just randomly, sometimes when someone asks for something, you will take another node that you have an open connection to and say, hey, uh, I'm going to upload this chunk to you or whatever, um, or upload a chunk to me. And then they'll do some, um, you know, data store, just chunk data, just, just data shuffling so that it looks like you got it from them or whatever. But with, with this extra noise, A, it means that data chunks can get stored in a distributed manner more quickly because now they're being exchanged as a correlation attack um, preventative measure. But B, now you can't correlate the traffic because you, you see that traffic is happening in both directions and there would be a lot of randomness to it, but like extra traffic would be added, um, you know, randomly uh, in random sizes and intervals so that there would be no correlation between anything. Like, oh, there's some packets here and there's some packets there. Yeah, you might hold the packets for a few seconds before you pass them on. You know, it, it really just depends on how you have things set up, how often other nodes communicate with you. The entire goal of the system would be to make it so that if, and the assumption is everybody could be spying on you. The only way to really determine what you're doing is if, basically every node that you talk to, and thus that can see your unencrypted traffic, every node you talk to is bad. Every node is the FBI. But the truth is, at that point, um, you're kind of screwed anyway, because that means that, you know, the government or whoever that is watching all, uh, intercepting all your communications, we're not talking about passively monitoring, we're talking about actively intercepting every communication you make. Which, by the way, the system would make a lot harder than that sounds because one of the things that you can do is set it up to where when you communicate with a node, that node has a key 
that they use just to talk to you and you exchange the keys and then you hold the keys for a while. So if someone comes in and tries to intercept the traffic, try to, you know, fire another key negotiation, you just go, oh, no, nope, they're trying to trick me. Not That's not going to work. And you refuse to talk to that node for a while. So you can cache the keys and not immediately allow them to cycle those keys too quickly. Uh, otherwise, it just won't work. You just won't talk to them. Anyway, those are a few of my thoughts on, on decentralized, distributed, privacy-focused, censorship-resistant communication. Yes, I'm aware that it can be used for very bad, but it can also be used for very good. Um, I am more of a WikiLeaks guy or an Edward Snowden guy than I am a let's uh, send, uh, uh, let's steal everyone's money and um, swap um, stolen identities and illegal adult images uh, kind of guy. So there you go. But it doesn't matter. The thing is, if you have a mach if you have something that's truly decentralized and censorship resistant, bad people will use it just as much as good. And that's kind of the point, is if it won't protect the bad guys, it certainly won't protect the good guys. And the bad guys probably already have privately created versions of this sort of thing anyway. So it doesn't matter. All right, I'm going to leave it there. Like, comment, subscribe, you know the drill. Have a great one. Take it easy. Even if your encrypted data, your supposedly end-to-end -end encrypted data is stored on some server somewhere, the camera wasn't pointed forward, but I'll tell you what happened. A truck turned left across the highway, didn't wait for the light to turn, just went ahead and did the turn left, which is fine if no traffic is coming, did it right in front of another car and then proceeded to cut through the right shoulder of the road to the right turning lane that they were going for. It would have been fine had they not turned left in front of the car. And since everybody in North Carolina is a giant pussy and won't honk their damn horn at anything, somebody's got to do it to make sure that these assholes know that their bad behavior has been seen because all it takes is people knowing, oh no, somebody noticed that I did a bad, and they might change their behavior. Anyway, back to the ramble.